Hi, good afternoon, everyone. This is Kira Zeitelman with NARUC, um, here to uh, kick off our webinar on rare earth elements from acid mine drainage with Dr. Paul Zimkevich um, from West Virginia University. Is uh, Commissioner Odin on? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Is it my time? You want me to go ahead, Kira? Yeah, you can go ahead. Or actually, first I'll say um, we're going to have Dr. Zimkevich give his presentation for about 30 minutes, and then we'll do a question and answer. So there are a couple ways in which you can ask questions once that time comes around. Uh, you can raise your hand using the little raise hand icon in GoToWebinar. Um, and then I can call on you on the phone and unmute you and you can ask your question. Uh, if that doesn't work, um, you can submit a question in the um, questions box uh, or in the chat box. Um, so hopefully one of those will work for everybody. Um, and with that, thanks everyone for joining us and I'll turn it over to Commissioner Odin. Thank you, Kira. And we are uh, glad that we could get this uh, done and a uh, great topic and I'm, I'm interested in getting into it. Uh, let me just go ahead and introduce, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Zimkevich real quick, uh, but then i uh, got a couple little things I want to tell the committee. So uh, Paul Zim, uh, sorry about that, Paul Zimkevich uh, is the director of the Water Research Institute at West Virginia University. Uh, Dr. he has been, uh, he's a native of Pittsburgh and has a PhD from the University of British Columbia and an MS and a BS from Utah State University in the Biological Sciences. After graduation, he worked for 10 years with the Alberta Department of Energy uh, before coming to West Virginia University in 1988 to serve as the director of the Water Research Institute. The institute develops and carries out environmental research projects in the region and on a national level. Research focus areas include management and treatment of waste streams from coal mining, and oil and gas developments. Uh, major programs include brownfield development, coal mine reclamation, water treatment, and watershed restoration. Uh, the Water Research Institute currently has about 15 and manages about 22 different projects, a little over five and a half million dollars. So we are proud to have you, uh, Dr. Zimkevich, with us. Uh, let me go ahead and then we can just end it, but let me get a couple of announcements if I can for the committee in. Uh, the Clean Coal Committee will also have another webcast next month on the 27th if you want to mark that. Um, we'll be focusing on the recent uh, extended and expanded section of the 45Q tax credits for carbon capture, uh, utilization, and sequestration. Uh, we will hear from members of the newly formed Carbon Capture Coalition on how these tax credits will generate new projects. Also, let me announce that the committee is still on schedule to go to Bismarck, North Dakota uh, to do a, to uh, a tour of coal and carbon capture facilities. This is going to be on May the 16th through the 18th. If you would like to go that, then please get a hold of Kira. Uh, we actually have some scholarships or reimbursements uh, that can be accessible. So uh, we wanted to make all of that, but I wanted just to get that out of the way. So. Uh, Dr. Zemkevich can take over and let's hear his presentation, which I think is a marvelous thing about rare earth. I know that uh, it may uh, get in a little bit of where we are at, but it will get in a lot where the coal mining industry is going. And so we want to hear that. So, Doctor, I'll give it to you and allow you to begin your presentation. Well, thank you very much, Commissioner. And uh, just as a matter of uh, courtesy to all the uh, listeners, uh, please call me Paul. I know Zimkevich can be a bit trying, so let's be informal here. I'd like to start out by going into the generalities of uh, what we're trying to accomplish here. We have three projects uh, so far, all funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, a National Energy Technology Lab, and they all deal, or these are the ones dealing with our, our rare earth program. And our, my colleagues are Zingbo Liu from our mechanical engineering department here, and also Aaron Noble in the mining engineering department at Virginia Tech. So I'll start out by talking about rare earth elements uh, and talking about the resource characterization because there's really no point in developing a very elaborate uh, and elegant extraction process for a, a minuscule and insignificant resource. So one of the things we want to do uh, and uh, 
we're working on is trying to identify and put a dimension on how big that resource is. So we'll talk about demand, um, what our overall project strategy is, what the feedstock looks like, and its various characteristics, and what, a little bit about AMD and its characteristics. Uh, this next slide shows the, the relative market dominance of various sources through time uh, of rare earths. Uh, the United States uh, was a big rare earth producer when the Mountain Pass mine was in operation between 65 and 85, roughly. And, that, and the Mountain Pass mine that was operated by Molly Corp uh, is pretty much uh, defunct. And virtually all of our rare earths now come from uh, the People's Republic of China. A, a lot of the, the Mountain Pass uh, rare earths were of the uh, what we call the light ends, and I'll get into that later. But all rare earth elements are not created equal in terms of their strategic importance and their value in the market. And I'll, I'll talk about what our advantages look like relative to the uh, current market supply. This next slide shows the projected market demand through 2025. I want to make sure I just drop one. And these are some data that I got from the Congressional Research Service and uh, also from the USGS. But it shows the the progression of global demand is about 158,000, 170,000 tons per year, growth at about 7% annually, and that's, this is total rare earths. And then the U.S. demand is about one-tenth of that, and the U.S. defense uh, requirements are maybe 5% of that. So keep these numbers in mind, the defense requirement, around 800 tons per year, maybe 900 in the future. The U.S. total market, 20,000 tons per year, and that's, again, total rare earths. So uh, these are the different projects that we've uh, been operating under uh, U.S. DOE funding. Um, we just passed a, a down select to move from an exploratory research program and looking at the feasibility of AMD materials as a AMD. I keep using the term AMD, acid mine drainage. Uh, bear with me. Uh, feedstocks as a as a uh, as a source, and having passed that initial uh, uh, test by USDOE, we moved on to a much uh, larger project, which involves construction of a three gram per hour uh, continuously fed pilot pro pilot plant in our facility here at WVU. Uh, that pilot plant is under construction now. And we hope to have it up and running by uh, late spring uh, this year. We also had this other project where we looked at the, we tried to put a dimension on the resource itself, how much acid mine drainage is out there, what rare earth concentrations uh, it, it contains, uh, what the distribution of the heavy versus the light and the critical rare earths look like in that resource, and what we can expect to be able to develop, and also, uh, and most importantly, what it would cost to develop that as a resource and turn into market ready products. These are some of the um, companies that we've worked with. Um, in our current project, uh, we're working with Rockwell Automation. Rockwell is providing us with uh, the system controls and sensing uh, package for our pilot plant. Uh, and I'll get into why that's critical. Uh, I'll get into the uh, details in a minute. So this next slide shows you the uh, objectives of our current set of projects and um, one of the key things here is the technology readiness and the environmental footprint. Uh, and one of the things we, we've found out about the rare earths from acid mine drainage is that unlike a lot of rare earth resource bases, they, they, we just don't see any uh, radioactivity in it. And a lot of the um, rare earth deposits, for example, from the hard rock uh, mining kind of uh, environment uh, generates a lot of uranium and thorium. That's one of the things that caused uh, the Mountain Pass mine to uh, go out of business. Basically, they were having troubles with their tailings management system, and it was uh, radioactive enough to be considered, I think, source material under uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission rules. Anyways, again, I'll get into that later. So what, how does it occur in, in our coals and pretty much any other coals? Uh, the, the main mineral is uh, monazite, which is a, a rare earth uh, phosphosilicate. 
And what you get are these uh, little chunks of monazite, which by the way are the same uh, ores that are commonly mined in big hard rock deposits, but these have been uh, knocked out of uh, batholiths. In our case, the Mississippi embayment went up into this country and uh, in Western Pennsylvania and Northern West Virginia and all through West Virginia and the Appalachians all the way down south. And that became the, uh, the sedimentary basin that filled with um, erosive materials from largely the granites that are now in uh, New England, uh, New Hampshire, uh, flooded down into this basin while the coal was being formed. So you get this intermixture of these uh, little monazite grains that came down with quartz and lots of other plastic sediments and uh, formed this um, mass of, of coal and uh, refuse and tailings that we, we deal with in every day with coal. What we what we found is that when the acid mine drainage, I'll go over the next slide, so you can see all of our coal in this part of the world has pyrite in it. You can see the little pyrite sheet on a um, facet of the coal uh, for one of our seams here. When exposed to air, that pyrite oxidizes and the, the products are uh, iron, which goes into solution, and sulfuric acid. And we're pretty sure that what, what's happening here is the sulfuric acid acts like a natural heat leach. And that in turn weathers these monazite grains that are in the plastic sediment in, associated with the coal, tailings, the roof rock, whatever, and liberates the, the uh, rare earth elements. So they are uh, liberated under low pH conditions and they precipitate uh, out once the pH gets up above five or so. Um, Acid mine drainage has been the, the bane of our existence in this part of the world for about a century now. It's responsible for more impaired stream miles than any other uh, impairment. And every once in a while you'll get these um, big discharges. Mines will fill up with uh, acid water and blow out when the hydrology is um, just right. And you can have miles of stream uh, uh, polluted. This uh, particular stream is the Castleman River on the right uh, near Myersdale, Pennsylvania. That was about 15 years ago. There was a big blowout. The orange stuff itself is ferric hydroxide, and we, we're pretty sure that the, the rare earths are also uh, liberated as hydroxides when they, uh, well, initially as, as ion, trivalent cations, and then once you start loading them up with uh, hydroxides and raise the pH, then they start precipitating out as hydroxides along with ferric and uh, hydroxide and aluminum hydroxide, which are the main elements that we deal with in acid mine drainage. So AMD sludge, is a result of uh, acid mine drainage treatment in order to meet Clean Water Act Section 402 conditions for a, an NPDES permit. So any active coal mine or power plant that generates acid mine drainage has to uh, ha comply with uh, state conditions such as they are for, um, for discharge. So the, there's a little cartoon in the lower left there, and you can see the a big blob of this could be tailings, it could be a mine, surface mine, underground mine, doesn't matter. But it, it, you have you have this this pyrite rich environment that is then exposed to oxygen, water, and creates acid mine drainage. The sulfuric acid then leaches out the the uh, rare earth elements along with the other metals, and it goes through a, a conventional acid mine drainage treatment plant, which usually involves uh, pH adjustment and oxidation. Uh, mainly to get ferrous iron to turn into ferric iron and drop out of solution at a lower pH. And then those products go into these uh, settling ponds. And I, the, the cartoon there, you can see the orange at the bottom is the sludge, or the uh, AMD metal hydroxides. And then you have a clear water layer develop on top. That is decanted to the NPDES discharge point and off to the waters of the United States. Now, traditionally, and up until about a year and a half ago, uh, acid mine drainage sludge was considered nothing but a liability, and mining companies or whoever was responsible for treating it wanted to make it go away as quickly as possible. So a lot of it was pumped into underground mine voids, buried in uh, refuse piles as they were being built. So you have these cells that would then be buried. So a lot of it is no longer on the surface, and, and most companies Again, wanted to make it disappear as quickly as possible. We have some examples, though. We have surveyed a lot of uh, AMD cells, uh, slurry cells, sludge cells, 
across West Virginia, Ohio, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. The one in the lower right is uh, a sludge cell on a bond forfeiture site that is uh, managed by West Virginia DEP. If you're familiar with it, it's the uh, DLM site in Upshur County. And we, we analyze these, the sludge. You can see it, there are footprints on it, so you can actually walk on this particular stuff. Some of it is very high in moisture content, but this stuff dries out pretty well. And that has a, an, what we call an in situ value of uh, $1.3 million in, in rare earth concentration. This, this one has some of the highest concentrations we've seen so far. It averages about 1.5 kilograms per ton of total rare earths. We just pulled a sample recently that came up to 4.4 kilograms per ton, which is extraordinary and I wouldn't consider it typical. Most of the sludges that we look at are in the range of 400 to 500 grams per ton. We, we estimate that the inherent value then is about $225 per kilogram, and that would be in, on the basis of mixed rare earth oxides. The in situ rare earth value, and that's, that's the value minus transportation and processing costs, is about $96 per ton dry weight, and refining costs at $65 a ton, ex estimated profit at about $30 per ton. And these numbers are generated by uh, our colleague Aaron Noble uh, from Virginia Tech. Sixty-one percent of the total rare earths that we get out of AMD sludge are either uh, critical or heavy rare earth elements, and as a result of that, the, the the estimated in situ value is a lot higher than you would get if you were dealing with a, a lower value uh, rare earth mix. And we estimate that a commercial refinery would recover its uh, capex and opex within two and a half years. This is a next one is a you can see a couple of um, shots of AMD treatment plants. These are pumped underground discharges uh, in the Pittsburgh seam. You can see on the lower left that image shows a, a lime tower. Uh, there's a pump house behind the, the lime tower which uh, pulls water up out of a mine to control the mine pool levels. And these are big flooded 10 to 30 square mile mine complexes. Oftentimes in the Pittsburgh seam. Water comes out of the ground. Uh, the iron is in the ferrous or reduced state. When the pH goes up to about nine or so, the uh, ferrous hydroxide precipitates out, and that's that blue stream in the middle coming down over that uh, hillside channel. And then you have to oxidize that, in this case mechanically, with a, a mechanical aerator to convert the ferrous to ferric hydroxide, and that's the orange stuff that we deal with. When we looked at the, the reason we got the idea to look at acid mine drainage in the first place when the uh, initial DOE solicitation came out, they were looking for coal, coal related byproducts. I, I happened to have an old set of data from the USGS from back in 1999, where they looked at uh, a lot of acid mine drainage sites ac across Pennsylvania. And this was a project that was initiated by uh, uh, late Congressman Murtha, who was looking for precious metals, so he asked the USGS to do a survey, and USGS being USGS, analyzed the entire periodic table, which no one had done with acid mine drainage before or since until recently. And so when I looked at this data set, I, I pretty quickly figured out that there was, a, there was a fair amount of acid mine drainage in the, in the untreated water going into these treatment plants and then nothing going out, which means that all of it had to wind up in the sludge, along with the iron, aluminum, and manganese. So that was, that was key to focusing our attention on, on the sludge. And also, we, 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 we did a survey looking at the, the untreated or raw water and the rare earth concentration relative to the pH. And that's where you get this, uh, this curve down here. And as soon as the pH gets below about four and a half or so, you start seeing elevated rare earth concentrations. Uh, above seven, there's very little left in solution. And that's a, a very important relationship for us in helping us to focus in on where to, to look for the, the good stuff. The uh, underground mine flooding status has a lot to do with controlling rare earth concentrations because it has a lot to do with the uh, pH of the, the water. If you have an unflooded, the upper right-hand corner, you can see low pH, high rare earth setting. These are the best sites for us because they, they are continuous rare earth generators. They, they remain acid virtually forever. 
and they, they're well aerated. Uh, these are largely made uh, illegal by the acid mine drainage policy of 1997, which I'm somewhat abashed to say I had a hand in developing in the first place. And to a large extent, these mines are no longer permitted. Uh, nevertheless, they still generate acid, so they generate a lot of the, of the reserve that we're interested in. On the other hand, the lower left-hand corner, you can see a high pH, low rare earth setting in these flooded underground mines, which are designed to become net alkaline over time. And, and they will because the, the geometry of the mines cuts off the oxygen supply and they simply stop generating fresh acid. So a lot of the, the big underground mines that are in play right now are in these categories. And the rare earth concentrations of those are more like you know, 50 to 100 uh, micrograms per, per liter, as opposed to maybe 800 to 1,000 in the above drainage, uh, more aerated settings. We'll talk about heavy rare earths versus light. And so this uh, shot of the periodic table uh, classifies the light versus the, versus the uh, heavy rare earths. The heavies being the blue, scandium and yttrium are considered heavy because of their mineralogical associations, and everything heavier than uh, ga uh, gadolinium is. Uh, and also, the, the, the ones in red are considered critical. Those are the ones that are in critical supply and uh, very important to uh, U.S. industrial needs. So we'll talk about critical, heavy, and, and light rare earths. This is our uh, this survey that we've, we are just wrapping up now for uh, West Virginia DEP, sorry, for US DOE. Uh, and you can see the red line across the middle is essentially the boundary between the Northern Appalachian coal field and the Central Appalachian coal field. So we, we, we took samples across uh, that boundary and you can see the sample locations uh, in the surrounding states. There's about 100 sampling locations in total. When we look at the, the distribution of rare earths in the central and uh, northern app, they really don't change very much. The, the, not only the uh, total concentration of TREE, -E, total rare earth elements, in central app is 410, it's 430 in the northern app. That's essentially slide rule error. Uh, overall, it's about 421 grams per ton. Uh, the distribution across the, the heavies, the criticals, and the lights really doesn't change very much. So we think we're looking at a fairly consistent um, material that essentially has a lot more to do with the weathering environment created by acid mine drainage than it does with whatever was in the rock originally. We think that the rare earths are pretty well evenly distributed through the coal measures, and it's just a matter of how strong the weathering environment is uh, in determining the concentration of rare earth elements in the uh, AMD. This is one of my favorite slides, and it didn't really show up here. What's next going on here? Hmm. <laughs> okay, so this is supposed to be the distribution of heavy rare earth elements in AMD sludge. On the left, let me try to describe what, what you should be seeing, because we're not. Hmm. Anyways, that should be a circle. <laughs> and then there's this little red line running down the middle. And those are the heavies, and everything else is light. And that represents the biggest uh, Chinese mine, which is Bayan Obo, and also Mountain Pass, California. And only about 5 to 10% of their total production is in the heavy and critical rare earths. Now, to the right, there's another, should be another pie chart uh, under South China clay. Those are lateritic deposits, basically weathered out ores. And in those cases, they are about 50% heavy rare earths. And so remember that that's a much smaller proportion of the total Chinese uh, production than the, the lights, as in by an oboe. So this next pie chart, uh, you can see the heavy and critical rare earths across all of our sampling so far, uh, sample size of 155. And this is percent dry weight. So all of the wedges that are colored, anything but gray shades, are, are the, the heavy rare earths. 
And that's about 44.5% of the total mix, which is not far off what the South China clays look like. And then if you add the criticals, then you get up to 61%. And the criticals are, their, their labels are in, in red. So we have a lot of neodymium. Neodymium is used in powerful magnets, for example, which is one of the critical elements. And we also have a lot of yttrium, which is another critical and heavy rare earth. So our distribution is very favorable, and that helps a lot with the kind of um, value that we're able to ascribe to these. So then in the next slide, you can see the rare earth concentrations, uh, and these are weighted according to value, and these values were provided by USDOE. And if you, if you read down the, uh, the column on the lower left, you can see scandium, for instance. It's about 3.4% of our total mix, and it's worth $15,000 per kilogram right now, or when these numbers came out. And that provides a, an enormous amount of the weighted value of the, of the mixed rare earths. And that, in turn, constitutes all that blue in the pie chart to the right. That's all uh, scandium value. So one of the reasons I, I like to point this out is that scandium, there's not that much of it on the world market, and it doesn't take much to collapse that price or to drive it through the roof. As with any limited uh, resource, a lot of these prices are very volatile. So uh, I, I, I'm glad that uh, NETL, in its wisdom, fixed the price at least for normalizing everyone's analysis for the time being. But mind, be mindful that, that these, these numbers can change uh, almost overnight, and, and as prices go up, of course, the market responds. But then, for no less, our our metal value for our, our material per kilogram of processed uh, total rare earth is about five hundred and fifty dollars per per kilogram. People often say, "Well, what is that in relation to gold?" Gold is about seventy thousand dollars per kilogram, so it's not as valuable as gold, by the way. So we have a, an image here of a of a uh, one of our samplers taking a sled sample, putting it in a bucket. Um, it's just a little half acre pond, and these little AMD treatment cells are all over the Appalachians. And this one is a quarter million dollars worth of a, uh, in situ rare earth value. These, this is a uh, aerial shot of a site that's uh, a special reclamation site managed by West Virginia DEP. And in this case, they, they have on the lower left, you can see the uh, AMB treatment plant. It's a big underground mine complex. Uh, there's a housing development on top of the underground mine complex. And the, the AMD is treated down in these uh, cells. Uh, there's a lime treatment unit here. And then the sludge is, uh, because they're space limited, is sent up to these to these geotubes, and it, each geotube is about 140 foot long, and these are geotextile fabrics, about 20 foot wide, five foot uh, high. The in situ value of each one of these is about $13,000, and the total value in this cell here is about $182,000. So naturally, our, our friends at West Virginia DEP uh, would very much like for someone to buy this stuff or just to take it off their hands so they can put more sludge into these uh, limited uh, storage capacities that they normally have. This is a close-up of uh, the, the geotubes at the, that particular mine. The water expresses out. Uh, it's a very tidy way, and the thing we like about it, of course, is it gets rid of water. So now you, now you have a, a semi-solid material that you can come in and excavate and haul away in a uh, dump truck. If we look at the, we, we're trying to do some estimates on the resource uh, size. So of all the sludge samples that we've looked at so, so far, and it's 155 sites, we estimate that the total rare earth mass is about 217 tons in that 155 sites. Multiply by three and you have kilograms. The in situ value at $225 per kilogram gives you an in situ value of $50 million, roughly. So that's... And by no means did we sample even the majority of sludge sites uh, uh, in the northern and central app. And certainly we did not look at anything in the uh, southern app. Coalfield uh, uh, colleague uh, who owns a um, mine in, near Evans, 
Evansville, Indiana, uh, sent some of his sludge after hearing one of my talks, sent me the sludge, his sludge to look at. This is Illinois Basin AMD, and it looked almost exactly like our Northern App AMD sludge. So I don't expect a whole lot of difference there if we uh, start looking closely at the, app, uh, sorry, the uh, Illinois Basin. The next uh, table down shows the uh, the, the flux, the uh, the acid mine drainage resource based on AMD production, and so if you look at the the total flow in liters per second, our sampled sites represent about 6,000 liters per second, and it's 140 sites. Um, this is um, th this next one, the um, total app with the <laughs> The um, the one uh, that's my that's Paul's estimate here, and I think there's are about mm, about 95,000 liters per second of acid mine drainage being generated in the basin. Uh, this next number over here was from a uh, study recently put out by some folks at uh, University of Pittsburgh. It's a much higher number. Uh, frankly, I hope they're right, but I don't think they are. Anyway, so taking that as a proportion of what we've sampled. Uh, proportionating the amount, the in situ value, or the uh, the flux per year that we measured is about 41 uh, tons per year and about 631 tons per year, uh, according to my estimate. Uh, according to the pit estimate, that would be 2,781 tons per year of acid mine drainage, and these would be the the annual production values. So I'm saying about 142 uh, million dollars. Um, the folks that did it right, then it's uh, 600 and some odd million, 600 million uh, tons, uh, dollars per year. Of, uh, and that would be uh, in situ value. So extracting it, one of the things we've found so far is that, that it's a real advantage is that because these, all of our rare earths started out in aqueous uh, phase, so these are basically trivalent cations in solution, and then the acid mine drainage process drops them out of solution as hydroxides, and all you have to do to make a hydroxide soluble again is add acid to it. I mean, it's not as simple as I'm letting on to be, but that will put them all back into solution, and then it's just a matter of separating the, the good stuff, the rare earths, from the, the stuff that you don't want, the gang minerals, the iron, aluminum, manganese, which are the bulk of the acid mine drainage sludge. The standard industry process for doing that is something called acid leaching and uh, solvent extraction. So this uh, next slide that you're looking at right now is uh, a view of some of our uh, solvent extraction mixer settlers that were uh, fabricated in, in Ontario and they're being shipped down to us right now for installation in our facility. So these will be set up in our lab and they will take feed each one of these mixer settlers in turn uh, it uses a, an organic uh, phase, usually uh, kerosene or, or heptane, we'll, we'll be using kerosene, uh, with a, an organic binder and that will selectively reach out and grab the uh, rare earths. And then we'll, that keeps enriching as you go from cell A to cell B. And eventually you'll wind up with a very pure, pure form of the, the mineral. Acid leaching solvent extraction is used Throughout the industry, this is a big solvent extraction plant uh, associated with a gold mining operation in uh, near Carlin, uh, Nevada. Uh, not apropos of anything, but except that this is standard industry technology, uh, we'll, we'll be refining it specifically for rare earths from this particular resource, and that would be the basis of our of our IP. So, in terms of revenue potential, uh, we see two two scenarios. We've we've optimized a a um, Centralized plant getting uh, a 2,100 ton per day feed, uh, and we think the payoff on that would be about two and a half years. Net present value about 63 million dollars, and we think the modular plant. And this is a plant that would move from one site to another, uh, and basically take whatever resources on the ground. Uh, we really haven't optimized this nearly to the same extent, so the economics are not looking as good as the other one, but. Certainly a centralized plant is looking very attractive right now. So that's it briefly. I'd be happy to answer any questions. So Kira will handle any questions you have. So if you got a question for Dr. Paul, then just uh, 
go ahead. Um, I'm amazed at the value of it, Dr. Paul. So um, has has anyone ever caught on to this? I know that China being the only uh, rare earth developer in the country, in the world right now, has anyone seen or had great interest just because of the value you presented to us? Now, prior to our, our, our study, no one really thought of acid mine drainage sludge as a uh, rare earth resource, no. Now, the, the Chinese have asked us for samples. <laughs> well, don't give it to them just yet. <laughs> I, I, I sent them the absolutely worst stuff that we have <laughs> between you all and me. <laughs> right. right. So, in the, in the process, do you, is the sludge, does it have all of the rare earth elements in it, or is it just selective on a certain amount? of a typical what's what in other words what would be the largest rare earth element within the sludge that you have found oh okay uh oh i've lost control of my screen oh i'm sorry i can give that back uh, <laughs> okay all right you should have it back now okay i think it's yttrium by the way let me, let me uh, verify that yep um yttrium at 24 percent uh, comes in number one and that's one of the critical elements? Uh, critical and heavy, yes. Do you the ones that really, the ones that really aren't very valuable are the lanthanum, cerium, praseodymium, these guys over on the upper right hand quarter. Would those still have to have any special treatment? Well, that's, that's a good question because one of the things we want to do with our, our pilot plant is optimize for the production of the more valuable rare earths. And we think we can do that and, and not spend as much time or money uh, extracting the lower value rare earths. And, and one thing that I didn't mention, I did not mention, is that uh, we have also looked at cobalt in, in, in this in the AMD sludge. Cobalt, which is worth about you know, between $65 and $95 per kilogram on the market right now, uh, represents about a third, sorry, 75% of the total rare earth mass. <laughs> if you take that mass multiplied by 0.7, basically, you'll have the, uh, the cobalt concentration. So there's almost as much cobalt as there is total rare earth in our, in our material. So we would be uh, stressing a, a Part of our process train to optimize for uh, cobalt refining. I have one last question. Then, um, is the the samples you're taking is mostly from West Virginia? I've seen you had another one in there. Is this um, pretty well prevalent across the country, or do we see these uh, elements changing uh, as when you change a coal field or a coal mine area? Well, in, in the Northern App field, we include um, Eastern Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Western Maryland, and Northern West Virginia. And in the Central App field, that would be West Virginia, uh, Southwestern Virginia, and uh, to a large extent, Eastern Kentucky. The difference in, in the rare earth uh, distribution, elemental distribution, in those two fields is almost non-existent. Now, and the other thing is, when we looked at the uh, sample from the Illinois Basin, it looked exactly like our, our acid mine drainage. And, and to make things even <laughs> more unusual, something I didn't expect is a friend of mine who works for the BLM sent me a sample of the uh, uh, sludge from the uh, Berkeley pit, uh, it's copper mine, middle of Butte, Montana. Uh, mm -hmm. We analyzed that, and it came out looking almost exactly like coal acid mine drainage. Uh, in terms of its rare earth concentrations and distributions. So one could almost make an assumption that the Southern app would look very similar. Yes, sir. And, and I've done a lot of work in the uh, Southern app around uh, Walker County, Alabama, and I know there's a lot of acid mine drainage in that part of the world. That would be us. <laughs> yeah, Tuscaloosa, um, yeah. There's, you had an earlier slide that showed a relation to one of the elements and granite. Was um, that correct? Let me see if I can. This one? Yes, sir. 
Okay. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a uh, photomicrograph. Uh, it just shows you a xenotime grain within a chunk of uh, coal. And xenotime, I think, is uh, yttrium phosphate. Okay, we'll so we open it. That, so we think that what happened was that basically it was the, the this was the delta that formed when the, the White Mountains in uh, New Hampshire and uh, northern New York State weathered and then started filling this basin. So the Appalachians had not risen at that point. Okay, Kira, that completes my question. Thanks. Uh, we had another question from uh, my colleague Catherine Klein um, on who who are the what is kind of the market for rare earth elements after they're extracted? Um, like I, I think I was kind of wondering this as well. Are there firms that like specifically buy and sell rare earth elements in the U.S.? Is there much of like an RE extraction industry, or did that kind of die out? Um, in the 80s as production in the U.S. was declining? Like what's kind yeah, of, I, I guess, ownership or the supply chain of rare earth elements? That that supply chain pretty much evaporated when uh, Mountain Pass closed down. And here's another, here's another thing. One of the uh, other sources of rare earths were uranium mill tailings. But in 1980, uh, the Uranium Mill Tailings Act rendered those as source material. And so no one wanted to touch them from that point on. So they were pretty much uh, capped and put to bed. Anyways, there, to answer your question, yes, there had been uh, magnet manufacturing facilities. I know there was one in Missouri. Uh, there was one in Texas, I believe. Um, there were some others I can't remember right now. But we did have a, a fully integrated supply chain in this, in this country uh, not too long ago. But right now, we just don't have it. So one of the things we don't want to do is simply generate uh, enriched feedstock to send to China so they can manufacture iPhones and send them back to us. So one of the one of our tasks under our DOE project is to is to develop a commercialization plan. And that would look at not only the the upstream end of it in terms of supply processing um, but also right right through what what the market requirements would be and how how that might be uh, we might sort of tailor our product to fit into whatever nascent supply chain we might have in this country. That's all speculative right now since um, that is yet to develop. Yeah, and, and we're, we're familiar with some of the applications of rare earth elements. Um, we've talked about some of the uh, national defense and, and medical and electronic uses. What about, why is it that, that scandium specifically is so much more valuable than some of the other elements? Well, one thing is is isn't very much of it. And I, th I think someone told me there were, the, the whole market for scandium last year was something like 40 tons internationally. That's, a, that's two dump truck loads of scandium, <laughs> if you think about it that way. So there, there, there isn't much about this, so it's very limited supply, but also in, in the, the applications are, are really important. Uh, for example, an F-35 fighter has uh, more than a ton, I think, of scandium in it, but it, scandium is, is a really, really good uh, aluminum alloy. So you can, you can alloy aluminum with scandium, and uh, you can make win, wings thinner, more heat resistant, um, more, I don't know, thermos, or, or aerodynamically uh, useful. Uh, so uh, they're using high-performance jet aircraft, but all, and also turbine blades for uh, high-performance uh, gas uh, steam turbines and steam turbines. Uh, baseball bats in, in include some scandium in them. The aluminum baseball bats that kids use. <laughs> they have scandium in them. Sorry. That, that explains why baseball bats are so expensive. <laughs> yeah, it's probably get more so too. Is there any relation with the REEs and uh, calcite? Calcite? Mm, not yeah. that I'm aware of. Okay. No, calcite is all, almost uh, poison to the whole process because it's a base, and that would raise the pH. So unless, uh, of course, you would think of a, a natural depositional process where you have an acid. Uh, groundwater with rare earths coming in contact with the calcite mass and precipitating out. Uh, but I really can't think of 
and, and maybe that's where some of the, uh, the natural deposits come from, but that's about it. And a lot of them are related to um, some of the metamorphic calcium forms, uh, calcite forms. Okay, is there any more questions? I actually had one more kind of a history question. This is Kira again. Um, it, it, it looked like, so you said Mountain Pass shut down in, in the mid 80s, um, but it looked like production in the US was still um, kind of going for, for another maybe decade or so after that. So do you know what, do you know what um, was responsible for that? I don't think that was Mountain Pass. Mountain Pass closed down for a while and then was restarted, but the mine was not restarted. What what went back into operation was a, a the, the uh, extraction plant itself, and they were being fed. That plant was being fed with tailings from the previous operation. So the mining had stopped. Uh, the pilot then then the extraction plant went on for a while, but then that came to an end. In fact, Mountain Pass was recently sold to the Chinese. And so the Chinese own it now. Do uh, outside of China and the USA, what other nations uh, in the late '80s, there, mid to late '80s, uh, increased their production? Are we looking at uh, African countries, or are we in Russia? Uh, the Russians, to some extent, Indians. Uh, I'm not sure if Zaire was involved in some of that as well. If there's something unusual, so you're usually minds it or mind it. Congo, no. Uh, but even even the Russians, for example, and the Indians, uh, their their contribution to the total uh, production in the world is is less than I think combined less than six percent. Hmm. Chinese just dominate by uh, by any measure. Here's Are there a, other uh, universities in the in the maybe south or, or north Appalachian areas that are conducting similar research? Like we've we've heard from NACL about their entire portfolio. I think they have um, I think they had seen projects last year up to 30 this fiscal year. Um, but do you guys do any kind of coordination uh, among the researchers? Yes. In fact, um, uh, our one of our guys, uh, Aaron Noble. Is actually at Virginia Tech, uh, and he's also he's also working on a uh, project, a rare earth project with the University of Kentucky. So, so there's U UK, Virginia Tech, ourselves among the uh, the Appalachian universities. Uh, really can't think of anyone else. Uh, University of North Dakota is working on uh, a rare earth project. Wyoming had been involved in the first phase, but I don't think they've moved on to second phase two. Um, and there's probably, there are probably more that I just can't think of offhand, but these are some of the uh, uh, the bigger projects. Uh, Ohio State recently got one to basically do a field survey. But we're the, we're the um, yeah, so we're we're focusing on the on the acid mine drainage side of it. Others are working on, like for example, the UK project is working largely on. Uh, Coal partings, so it's the uh, the refuse or tailings fraction from coal cleaning, and they're processing that, doing a lot of conventional sort of hydromet uh, classification, and then going from that after they've uh, purified basically the the monazite grains, uh, separated that from quartz and clay and all the other stuff, uh, then they're going into uh, acid extraction and solvent extraction that would look a lot like the tail end of our process. And uh, there's a company called, I think, uh, RPI in Massachusetts that's working on trying to extract from coal fly ash. And I've done a lot of work in fly ash in the past, and it's very difficult to basically knock apart the aluminosilicate spheres in fly ash, and that's apparently where the rare earths are. So that's, that's a very rigorous uh, acid extraction, alkaline roasting process. Uh, by the way, and, and by the way, uh, NETL is having a, uh, a technology review on the subject in Pittsburgh. 
uh, I think on the 10th of April coming up. And Marianne Alvin is organizing that. Doctor, what is the environmental impact after you remove this? Is it lesser to a great degree uh, for the ponds or is it, uh, does it make any difference? If you look at the total amount of sludge and what we would be removing from the sludge, the volume change would be negligible and chemically it really wouldn't change very much. What we don't do is make anything worse. So we do not have a radioactive tailings. Uh, we we do not add anything to the, the sludge that's particularly wicked. Uh, in fact, it, the sludge can be disposed of just as AMD sludge is being disposed of right now. So that is chemically exactly the same. And then one of the other things I like to stress is that it, this does incentivize acid mine drainage treatment. So hopefully people will look at the 75% of our acid mine drainage that's pre-law and, ha and essentially orphaned mines. Uh, maybe this will encourage people to pick up some of those discharges and uh, start treating them uh, just for the rare earth extraction value. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zimkevich. I don't see any other questions, um, so I'll just conclude by uh, just reminding everyone about Commissioner Odin's announcements at the beginning. Uh, we have the site visit to North Dakota in May, May 16th through 18th. Um, I'd be happy to answer people's questions um, and uh, provide more info on the travel reimbursement funding that we have available, thanks to the Department of Energy. Um, and we'll also have uh, another webinar coming up on the Section 45Q tax credit for carbon capture and storage uh, that was recently passed. Um, so we'll be talking to the Carbon Capture Coalition uh, about the prospects for carbon capture after that tax credit has been uh, expanded. Um, so uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you to uh, Dr. Zinkevich for uh, making the time to speak with us. And I'll hope to uh, see you all next month. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.